Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nimit. I'm one of the co-founders at Votes, and I'm here to talk about some of the security data we've collected during the course of our mobile voting pilots over the last couple of years. So before we dive into the data, just a quick overview about Votes. As many of you may know, Votes is the youngest elections company in the US. We got started almost by accident after winning a hackathon at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, way back in 2014. The theme of the hackathon was Hack to the Future. What's the one thing you would do in the future and how you do do it? And so my brother and I, we were there and we ended up prototyping this um, new election system, which used smartphones, biometrics, uh, real-time identity verification, and then also log the ballots on a blockchain-based infrastructure. But to our surprise, we ended up winning the first prize, and that led to a whole series of events, and eventually the company started in 2015. So since then, we've done 67 elections so far, and 11 of these have been public government election pilots. We've also done non-governmental elections, primarily with the state political parties in various states. And so some of the data we're going to share today covers uh, a wide array of our elections from a security perspective. And then we'll also dive in into a couple of really interesting elections we did recently, where for the first time we were able to collect a lot of interesting data. So... I'll begin with a quick introduction about, about our system. It's a smartphone app-based mobile voting platform. And the key components here are essentially the voters' smartphone devices, so an iPhone or a compatible Android. Then you have the cloud infrastructure where the backend servers are running and also distributed uh, blockchain infrastructure. And then you have the election administration specific interfaces to the election jurisdiction. And then from there, their traditional infrastructure is ballot printers and the tabulation equipment. And the way the entire process works is essentially right now the system is being piloted only for absentee voters. And within absentee voters, a very small subset of people essentially uh, military voters who are deployed, their families and any U.S. citizen who's living overseas. Um, they're commonly referred to as Yokawa voters. And so if you're in that eligible group in your jurisdiction is participating in a pilot, then you sign up normally as an absentee voter and then submit a form to your election clerk, typically your county clerk, and then they do a little bit of vetting. And then if you're eligible, they will pre-provision you on the vote system. And then you get an invitation to download the application on your smartphone, iPhone, or compatible Android device. So you begin with the, with the email number and an email ID and a mobile number. And then once you've done the initial onboarding, you are asked to do a identity check. So you'll have to take a picture of a government-issued photo ID. Right now, you can use a driver's license, state ID, or a passport. You can use some other forms of ID as well if you don't, don't have those three, but those are the most commonly used ones. And then once you've done the scan in the application, front and back, then you're asked to take a live video selfie. And then uh, once you've completed that, it does a matching to make sure the picture you took of yourself matches the picture on the ID liveness check is, is done as well to you know, weed out deep fakes or any other kind of uh, fraudulent activity. And once everything matches, data on your ID is compared to the voter registration file, which is provided to us by the jurisdiction for the pilot. All that matches, your identity is digitized, stored in the secure uh, space on the, on the handset, and all the documents you've provided are deleted at that point because we, we don't need them. and We don't want to increase the threat surface after that as well. 
So at this point, you're ready to receive your ballot. So as you can see from the flow diagram, it's essentially a 10-step process. And once you've received the ballot, it's essentially your mobile representation of your actual paper ballot, which you would receive if you went to vote in person at your precinct, or if you opted into vote by mail, essentially the same ballot you'd get here. And so you map the ballot on the phone, and then you may be asked to sign an affidavit, sign with the finger on the screen. And then once you're ready to submit, you confirm your choices, do your biometric verification on the, on the device again. And at that point, your ballot gets uh, submitted to the network, anonymized, and you get a receipt so you can verify your selections and then also participate in the, in the audit process as well. And in the background, the jurisdiction gets an anonymized, an anonymized copy of your receipt. And then close to election day, a paper ballot is printed. And then there's a pre-tabulation audit. On election day, printed paper ballots are tabulated just like other paper ballots. And um, there's no hand reproduction required. And then once the election's over during the canvas phase, there's a full audit where receipts are prepared. So end to end, that's how the, the process works. Now that we've looked at kind of how the, the system functions, let's look at the threat model. So as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty interesting threat model here, obviously because it's an internet connected device. It is different from uh, traditional methods of voting. So let's kind of run through the, the flow and at each step we can, uh, can look at the, some of the threats. This is the first phase, as you saw, you opted in, the county clerk proves you, and then you've started to download the app. So obviously, if you're not careful, you could download an incorrect app by mistake, or um, the app may already be compromised ahead of time by a bad actor, or there may be malware on your device, which you know prevents normal functioning of the application. So it's kind of the first stage. Next, look at now you're at the voting stage. So the threats here are maybe the biometric capability on your phone you know, isn't working as, as it's supposed to. And obviously at this stage, if there's malware, you know, apps can be reverse engineered and they can be attempts made to change, uh, change how you're voting. So that's a threat vector and we'll see how there are ways to mitigate that a little bit later. And then obviously in the transmission phase, the transmission um, is not secured, the transmission channel, that data may never reach the destination or may corrupt it on the way. So we look at ways as to how that can potentially be mitigated as well. And then the voter gets a receipt. So the receipt, um, there's a chance somebody else may get hold of your receipt if you're not careful. Uh, obviously, that's an active area of research on how to create self-destructing uh, receipts but uh, it's a potential threat vector. And so, and then finally, once the ballots reach the jurisdiction, uh, as they are printing the paper ballot for tabulation and um, they do a pre-tabulation audit, so there is a potential threat vector, which would likely get caught by the pre-tabulation audit. Nevertheless, uh, important to keep in mind. Actually, thank LA Times for making this nice picture available to us, uh, very nicely done makes it simple to understand. And so now that we've looked at the kind of the high level threat model, let's look at what kind of threats we've kind of seen in the wild over the last couple of years. So we, we like to group them into a few different categories. So there's obviously threats at the device level, there's threats at the network level. And so those are kind of user-centric scenarios and then Overall is the cloud infrastructure, our corporate network. So obviously those are areas of interest as well. So in terms of what we've seen, passive scanning, obviously, which happens to pretty much everybody these days who has public uh, facing web asset. We've also seen active analysis of our web assets. So people actually trying to reverse engineer some of that stuff and phishing of our staff, clients, email spoofing attempts as well, social engineering. 
obviously we are well aware of what happened recently. Um, we've had attempts uh, at phone calls, people pretending to be who they're not. We've seen DNS tampering attempts as well, SIM swap, SIM takeover attempts, and then reverse engineering of the mobile applications, sometimes partial, and then through the analysis, mobile API level attacks. So people actually trying to figure out how the API is working and trying to attack it. We've also seen um, on the Android side attempts to compromise the TE where the, some of the keys are stored. And then malware, we do come across malware, uh, several devices, and um, we'll see later on in one of our elections, an interesting, uh, interesting case that came to light. So before we dive into some of the data, we thought it'd be useful to look at the MITRE attack framework. So recently, MITRE updated the mapping for not just the enterprise side, which covers the cloud aspects in our case, but also the mobile side. So um, we mapped that data to what we've seen, as, as you can see on iOS, some interesting um, things to note at the device level. And then similarly, network-based vectors. So we already spoke about the SIM swap, SIM swap. And then you'll see some of the other ones in the, in the data head, such as uh, you know, rogue, uh, rogue Wi-Fi and things like that. Similarly, on the Android side, Similar to iOS, a couple of uh, kind of different things, but we find uh, the mapping useful just as we plan out our you know, work, and I'm sure a lot of you are looking at this as well. Uh, similarly, on the on the network side for, for Android, let's look at a few case studies here. 2018 was when we, we had uh, first opportunity to do uh, public elections in, in the U.S., and so since then, we've had some um, interesting opportunities to collect data. So we'll start with something from, um, from 2018. Um, one of the really interesting things we saw early on back then was the uh, attempts to use multiple devices with the same, um, same adversary and using um, different uh, mobile numbers and emails and trying to do the same thing. And so in that scenario, the mitigation deployed by the system was to treat this as a malicious activity and uh, block, block this access. We did see people use phone numbers in some telco blacklist, as well as uh, people using well-known tools like Burp Suite to probe the platform, probe the API endpoints. And in one of these cases, um, we were able to record the traffic through a honeypot. So some of that is available as part of the open data package and is also available. We'll share some uh, public links at the end of the presentation so you can get it from there as well. The other interesting thing from a case study perspective was uh, people trying to reverse engineer the application. The, the system has an initial handshake process and we saw some attempts, manual attempts to uh, engineer that handshake process. And so in that scenario as well, uh, one of the mitigations was to block the IP address ranges or block the device IDs, depending on the, on the nature of the attack. But uh, that's an area where we have some feedback on better approaches to mitigate those kinds of uh, attempts. Email spoofing, so we did see we continue to see a lot of uh, email spoofing attempts and obviously with, with DMARC that, that helps to mitigate that. But nevertheless, we do keep track of it. Another interesting case study was involved um, essentially network-based attempts to scan the passively and then use that information to actively look at our infrastructure, particularly the API endpoints. So that's where we see a lot, uh, lot of interest. And then um, more recently, we've had an opportunity to do somewhat larger elections in terms of uh, participation. Some of the early pilots had uh, a very small number of voters. So the opportunity to collect meaningful data was a little limited from a security, on-device security, network security perspective. 
but with one of the elections this year, or a few of the elections this year, we've been able to collect um, some very interesting data to analyze, and so I'd love to, love to share that. One focuses around, we call as the mobile, mobile threat detection. We partner with third parties for that capability, as well as some in-house stuff we have. And the way that's structured is, a, we call it a multi-channel component architecture. The device is communicating with obviously our backend, but also communicating with the, the third party system. Similarly, our backend is communicating with the third party system. A good example was somebody tries to reverse engineer the app and you know hooks the specific locations where some of that code is getting triggered to try and bypass it. You could potentially disrupt two of these channels but be hard to disrupt the third channel. So that, in this case, uh, acts as a saving grace and also as a kind of extra detection mechanism. And so some of this capability is actively deployed. Next, probably the most interesting part of the presentation. So this is data from one of our recent elections where a few thousand people participated. And this was kind of the device split predominantly more iOS than Android. And then in terms of the, the threats we detected on the network side, it was pretty even, 50-50. But on the device side, we saw sort of a lopsided uh, share of threats being detected on Android. And that could be function of the devices that were being used uh, or maybe other unique factors to this to selection as well. But something interesting to keep in mind sort of diving one level deeper. So on the iOS side, let's kind of look at some of the network um, security threats. And this, this data, by the way, is available in the open data set. I believe it's the part one. So uh, uh, you can kind of dive in at your convenience as well. But at the iOS level, we saw 18 devices um, who were connected. So this was amongst the few thousand and the 64% who were using iOS. There were 18 devices detected which um, the Wi-Fi was deemed to be unsafe. And so obviously that creates a potential for a man in the middle type of attack. So the user experience was they were not able to complete the process on the device or um, asked to contact the support team. And in that case, they were requested to either switch to the cellular network or switch to a different Wi-Fi network uh, in this case, uh, once they did that, they were able to proceed. Similarly, on Android, similar number, about 17. On Android, we also saw an interesting case um, of a potential uh, ARP poisoning. ARP is uh, you know, address resolution protocols, I'm sure many of you know. In this case, it was a little hard for a support team to detect because we didn't have visibility into what the voter's home network looked like. And so it required a little bit of troubleshooting, but eventually it turned out to be a media device, which was um, causing this uh, poisoning. And so team requested the voter to turn off the media device. And then the threat went away and they were, they were able to proceed. So an area we'd love to do a little more, more research but it was interesting that we came across this one in case. Next, let's look at some device level threats. On the iOS side, we did detect a few devices where the pin was not set. So in that case, mitigation or resolution was to force the users to set pin or activate the biometrics on the, on the device. Otherwise, they couldn't really proceed. And we saw <clears throat> a few cases of uh, side-loaded apps and in each of those cases, when um, a little bit of uh, due diligence was done, they were deemed to be legitimate apps, and so the voters were able to proceed. But it was, it was good to see them being detected in case you know they could pose a threat, and so definitely something we'd like to research more on. On the Android side, much larger number of devices without pins, which we weren't sure why, but was interesting. Eighty-nine devices didn't have pin set, so all those voters were forced to set a pin or activate the biometric capability on the devices. 
similarly on the side loaded uh, side of uh, things a lot more side loaded apps uh, which kind of made sense given the ecosystem on android so they take um, quite a bit of time to go through these uh, make sure everything was okay luckily we had the election went for three days so our support team had enough time to troubleshoot in this investigation we did find two instances where the device did have malware and it was a fairly well known malware i'm sure many of you probably heard about it but um, it was interesting that we, we were able to detect this inform the voter they were able to delete the offending apps reset the devices and then uh, proceed and then once the the new checks were confirmed they were actually able to vote successfully and complete the audit as well a couple of other interesting android specific things we did detect some instances of uh, usb debugging being enabled nothing malicious on that front but cuz during the act of voting the phone was not connected to a computer so that was fine and then we did have another 21 devices where developer options were enabled so once a, no no direct impact but something we like to keep track of and so as i mentioned earlier this data is available as part of a uh, package we've uh, released we'd love um, love more feedback and suggestions on how to collect how to analyze this you know in a better way especially you know areas around malware and other uh, really interesting um, things we we were able to learn from here and you'll notice that the data is for the most part um, anonymized and that's true of the collection process as well the voter is the one who's asked to initiate not knowing what exactly has happened so the data does not contain uh, any personally identifying uh, information to the best of our knowledge and um, lastly love uh, love any suggestions and feedback from the community a very young uh, company or the youngest company in this space uh, trying to do um, something which um, is unusual to say the least and so we love suggestions and feedback to improve and what things we could do better and um, appreciate the participation of the community thank you for the defcon voting village team for giving us this opportunity to share this uh, data and uh, we'd be sharing more of this data uh, as as we do more election pilots and um, we'd love to continue to get feedback from everybody uh, more information is available on our website especially under white papers and under the security section so please feel free to explore and give us uh, feedback and look at the data as it's uh, posted in the future as well once again uh, thank you and uh, hope you all have a great uh, devcon experience this year especially at the uh, morning village thank you take it